Praise the Lord, His mercy is blood, stronger than darkness, new every morn, I sense they are many, His mercy is more. Lord, thank you so much that your mercy is new every single morning. God, I pray that the word of God will dwell richly in us tonight, Lord. I pray that your words become life and truth to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Peace. Can you hear me all right? All right. Well, welcome to the very first Sunday night theology. Are you excited? Yeah. Or a little bit trepidatious? <laughs> What have we gotten ourselves into? Well, let me say a first, uh, a couple of things here as we're getting started. First off, um, hopefully when you came in, you grabbed a couple of handouts that are in the very back here. If you did not grab the handouts of the notes and then the Chicago statement on biblical inerrancy, I would encourage you to go get them now. Uh, and if you don't have them, maybe you could Put your hand up and somebody would be able to grab those for you. That's going to be very vital for you in what we're going to be talking about tonight. So let me just kind of give you an idea of what we're doing here. Uh, with Sunday Night Theology, as you know, this is the very last Sunday night of the month. And our goal here on the Sunday Night Theology is these are not sermons. Okay, this is not necessarily a devotional. 
This is what I am calling a talk. That's really descriptive, isn't it? The idea here is, is I'm not getting behind the pulpit, not because what I'm saying is, an ins- is insignificant, but because we're wanting this to be a, a lecture of sorts, but also an interaction. Uh, so if you have questions while we're going through things, I would encourage you to write down your questions. And at the end of every section, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, let's stop And let's talk about maybe a couple of things that we've talked about. So we're going to make statements, and I'm just wanting to hear, do you have questions about those statements? We have a microphone here in the aisle. The purpose for this microphone is that you will ask your questions here at the microphone. The idea here is we are being live streamed, so we are being joined with people online. We want them to hear your questions, and we want them to hear the rapport and the interaction. So what we are wanting to do with our Sunday night theology is we are wanting to take take deep doctrinal theological truths and we're wanting to give clarity to them, we're wanting to explain them, we're wanting to give the importance of them, and then we're wanting to give the application to it, okay? So that's what we're wanting to do here tonight. Uh, Hopefully you have a schedule um, of of what we're going to be talking about this year. So if you have this, you'll have an idea of what we're going to be talking about going forward. Um... We are not starting with maybe what might excite you the most. So you might be the type of person that's really excited about to talk about Christianity and the government. We'll get there. You might be very interested in when we talk about transgenderism, right? So how does the Bible and Christianity relate to transgenderism? And how do we understand those things? Maybe the idea of evolution is really exciting to you. Or maybe you personally struggle with the idea of forgiveness. So these are things that we're all going to be talking about this year. But we picked, or I should say I picked, the doctrine of Scripture as the foundational beginning point for a couple of different reasons. The reason why I picked the doctrine of Scripture, and I'm, got, I'm in control of my slides here tonight, so I want to make sure that I've got it. The reason why uh, we picked the doctrine of Scripture is because this is the very basis for everything that you and I say we believe and understand. To put it another way, if we started with, for instance, transgenderism, and we tried to explain why we believe transgenderism is wrong, or why we believe homosexuality is wrong, or what we believe about the government and church pertaining to government, well, we would have no objective basis of authority if we didn't first have a foundational understanding of Scripture. Does that make sense? So the authority that you and I have is not inherent to our best thinking or what we think about things. It's inherent to the authority of God through his word. So if we fail to miss, or if we fail to understand, I should say, what God's word is saying, then we're going to miss on every, on every objective. Okay, so we have to start here. This has to be our beginning point. So we are going to start uh, by teaching how to think biblically. We're going to take a theological topic, really every uh, last Sunday night of the month, take a theological topic, give it meaning, explanation, application, and and here's the way I want to do it. I'm going to present the topic, and then I'm going to give different facets of the topic, and some of these will be going deep, deep theologically, okay? But we're always going for simplicity to try to understand it as best as we can, and then I'm always going to try to apply it. Hey, this theological truth leads to this thinking or this outcome, okay? Does that make sense? So let's first start off with what is the doctrine of Scripture. Let me also just say this very quickly. Um, The notes that I have given you are not fill in the blank, okay? It's not because I don't want you taking notes. It's because I don't want you distracted by trying to fill in blanks because otherwise that's kind of all you'll be paying attention to is what is the blank and what's the next one and whether you're following along. I don't want you to be worried about missing a blank. I want you to be writing free notes as much as possible on the sidelines or if you have paper with you to write on the side of that as well. I will be having quotes and scriptures up on the slides that are not in your handouts, okay? So for those of you in the back, some of the text might get a little bit small. So I do apologize. If you can't understand it from that far back, you can always come close. Closer. Also, we're going to be going for about an hour and a half, okay? So if for some reason you just need to get up, guess what? You're an adult, right? Or you're with an adult. So do what you need to do, all right? So do whatever you need to do. Just try not to be too distracting, but we want to make sure that we're um, jumping into this rightly. So let's talk about what is the doctrine of Scripture. Martin Luther, he was the, one of the most, inf- uh, most important reformers, we should say. This is what he said about Scripture. He said, the Scriptures 
or our vineyard in which we should all work. Okay, I like to, I wanted to begin with that because this is a foundational understanding that this is where we get our sustenance, that's the vineyard, and it's this basic understanding that this isn't just the work of a teacher, this isn't just the work of a preacher, this is the work of all of God's people. And so when we're talking about understanding scripture, this is foundational to each and every one of us. So let me give you kind of a definition here. And you'll have to forgive me for, I'm going to be turning a lot to look at this as well with you. So the doctrine of scripture, just to kind of give a big picture before we jump into its explanation, the doctrine of scripture is the perfect authoritative words of God superintended over human authors to sufficiently reveal himself and redemption. It's the perfect authoritative word of God superintended or or managed through human authors to sufficiently reveal himself in redemption. So you should be noticing there's, there's a mixture here. There's a joining, a marriage between God doing something divinely, a miraculous work mixed with human involvement, okay? And, and those are both essential elements. Also, I want you to see that this is perfectly authoritative, and there are some strong implications that that's going to have if this statement is true. If Scripture is indeed perfectly authoritative, if this is indeed God working through humans to bring about these words for us, then that is the only way that you and I know this thing called redemption, and redemption is salvation. So we're saying very clearly, hopefully from the very beginning, the reason why you and I have faith is because of what God has done through his word, and that's going to have some significant implications going forward. Let me ask a a question that's going to jump into some big issues. Why start with the doctrine of Scripture? Something that's kind of amazing is that this is the foundational uh, premise to your Christian faith. Um, Whether you've thought very deeply about this or not, the reason you are a Christian is in large part because there is such a thing as the word of God. If there was no such thing as the word of God, you would not have faith right now. And I mean to prove that to you just here in a moment. But think about the awesome reality that God, the creator over all things, has somehow worked in such a way that the created can understand the creator. The finite can understand the infinite. Not perfectly, and we're going to see that tonight. Not perfectly, but that you and I can understand this God. We can understand the salvation of this God through this thing that you and I are holding in our hands called the Word of God. So when we talk about Scripture and the doctrine of Scripture, as we have this um, definition given us to just a moment ago, we need to say very clearly that what you believe about Scripture reveals what you believe about God. If this work of Scripture, if this is indeed God working, and this is something that God has given, then how you and I treat Scripture, how you and I study Scripture and seek to understand it and the priority we give to it, how you view Scripture is how you're going to view or understand God, which I'm going to get into some applications later on, so I don't want to get too far into this, but that's why a lot of churches are really struggling to know God or proclaim God. It's because they have taken the word of God and they have miserably failed in rightly understanding the God of scriptures. If, if you're going to lose scripture, then you're going to lose the God of scripture. So what you believe about scripture is going to tell you and tell me much about what you believe about God. Now, in order to talk about this idea of how do we know about God, Really, we can't start with this idea of Scripture. Yes, what we, what we know about Scripture is going to help us uh, understand what we know about God, but there is such a thing as knowing about God that's outside of Scripture. And I want to make sure that this is in your slides, or these are in your handouts. Um, so that's second bullet point, general revelation and special revelation. These are two very important words because these are two ideas to help us know how do we understand God. Special revelation is going to get to scripture. So let me start with general revelation. When we talk about general revelation, we are saying that God has worked through nature so that you know who he is. You don't know the details about him. You don't know the name of Jesus through creation. You cannot know the holiness of God through creation. You cannot know the omniscience of God through creation. But you do know there is a God through creation itself. And the second one that we'll see here just in a moment is your conscience, that you know there is a God because you have an innate something within you that tells you the difference from right and wrong. But, But the first way that we understand general revelation is that God reveals himself through creation. 
This is the idea that when you look outside, when you look at mountains, when you look at a sunset, when you look at a sunrise, if you're one of those crazy early morning risers, you cannot help but be overcome with a sense there's something greater than you, right? Have you ever been out in Kansas or in, in the Southwest and you see such a vast sky that us Missourians have no idea what to do with because it's so flat and you all of a sudden realize how teeny tiny you are? Uh, or I don't know exactly what it was, but something recently has landed on Mars. Have you guys been keeping up with this? And it's amazing that there's some pictures taken from this rover or whatever it is from Mars looking back at Earth. You know what we look like? exactly what Mars looks like, teeny tiny speck. And you and I on that teeny tiny speck are a teeny, teeny tiny speck. We have this understanding and the more we understand about nature, the more we understand of the atmosphere and all of these things, the more we recognize how infinitely small we are. We understand that there is something bigger and more wonderful than us. We understand there's a God through, or through creation. So the Belgic Confession, which, whoo, that is hard to read. I do apologize. Let me read it to you from my paper. <laughs> it says, we know him by two means. This is the confession from 1561. We know him by two means. First, by the creation, preservation, and government of the universe, which is before our eyes as a most elegant book, wherein all creatures, great and small, are as so many characters leading us to see clearly the invisible things of God, even his everlasting power and divinity, as the Apostle Paul says in Romans 1.20, all which things are sufficient to convince men and leave them without excuse. Man, it's so tiny. Second, he makes himself more clearly and fully known to us by his holy and divine word, that is to say, as far as is necessary for us to know in his life, in this life, to his glory and salvation. So it's this idea, the first part of that confession is what we're really focusing on, that you and I know there is a God because of the creation that we see around us. I'm losing control of my... Uh, did I do something here? I can go on without my slides, but I don't want to. Okay, I'm going to keep going on with my slides, and if something changes, you all let me know. This is all throughout Scripture. Let me give you just a couple of examples here. Psalm chapter 19, verses 1 through 2. Sorry that it's not on the slide above you. But Psalm 19, verses 1 and 2 says, The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. So the heavens are declaring the truth of God's word, uh, that God is real, that he exists. Romans 1.20 says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood, check this out, through what has been made so that people, man, is without excuse. So you are not able to be saved by creation, but you know that there is a God through creation. Does that make sense? So there is a knowledge of God that comes through the things that you see around you. It doesn't lead you to faith in Jesus Christ, but it does lead you to know that God is real. So therefore, by the way, you're responsible to God because of creation. Uh, nobody can say, but I didn't know there was a God. Everybody is responsible for their sin because, in part, of creation. There's a second reason that we are accountable to God. And this is in your notes. Uh, hopefully you see this. Yeah. God reveals himself through human conscience. Do you see that in the uh, third bullet point there? God reveals himself through your conscience. That is a part of your soul. There is a part of your soul that bears within you an understanding of the natural law, which is what we call right from wrong. And this is part of what it means to be made in the image of God, by the way. Right? So the image of God is a big issue. What does it mean to be made in the image of God? In part, it means that you know right from wrong, not because somebody has to tell you that, but because there's something deep within your very soul of your being that you know it's wrong to hit your sister. Right? It's wrong to cheat on your taxes. doesn't mean that you don't do those things, but you know that it's wrong. And the more you do it, the more you mute it. Right? Your parents taught you that. But nonetheless, we are given this conscience in our very core of our being that helps us know this is wrong, whatever it might be. Uh, C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity, he excels in natural law. This is what uh, C.S. Lewis wrote. He said, quote, When a man is getting better, he understands more and more clearly the evil that is still left in him. When a man is getting worse, he understands his own badness less and less. 
This is what scripture would say about your conscience. Romans 1, 18 and 19. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that which is known about God, hear this, is evident within them. Evident within you is the imprint of God so that we are not without excuse. God made it evident in them. What does that then look like in the conscience? Romans 2, 14 and 15. When Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, somebody who hasn't been trained in the God's word, but yet does the things of God's word, not having the law, they are a law to themselves in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternatively accusing or else defending them. Now, this is going to be absolutely vital for us to see going forward, that when we start talking about some very applicable issues of society, of life, we have to see that every single person, if they're made in the image of God, has some sort of an awareness about God and right and wrong. Now, that doesn't mean that people are going to follow that, right? We can just look at our culture. Uh, we can look at our society. and We can see there's a lot of, of muting of what our conscience has said, but it's, it's pivotal for us to understand that there is a conscience within each and every person, and if you're a believer, you must appeal to that conscience because there is something innately within us to help us know God is real. There is a right and wrong, and you and I are the not, that you and I are not the authority of right and wrong. There's something else that teaches us more than what our conscience and creation can do, which that is what special revelation is. So this is still in your notes, and I do apologize. Can do we do anything to fix the slides, or is that just... Yeah, no. All right, I'm just going to set that aside and not even gonna try to work with it anymore. Okay, so special revelation. If general revelation is the common grace... Of, of, of creation and your conscience that tells you that there is a God, then what is special revelation? Special revelation in your notes is a supernatural revelation of God. Sup special revelation is a supernatural revelation of God. To put it another way, special revelation is the revelation of salvation. Okay? You cannot know about Jesus Christ unless the word of God is true and real and has been proclaimed to you. You cannot know salvation of redemption unless you know about the blood of Jesus Christ. You cannot know, you can know that you're wrong, but you can't know the answer to being wrong unless you have read the word of God or somebody else has read the word of God and explains it to you, right? So this idea of special revelation helps us to understand that it's only through scripture that we can know right from wrong that leads us to salvation. I'm just such an optimist. I'm gonna keep trying, <laughs> But then I'll just keep going. Okay, so what does this tell us in Scripture, about Scripture? Paul tells Timothy this in 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17. Check this out. It says, in that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Do you hear what Paul's saying? Timothy, how do you have salvation? It's through the sacred writings that has led you to Jesus Christ. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2 says, Long ago, at so many times and in so many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. That's in the God's word. And in these last days, God has spoken to us by his son. That's in God's word. Whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also God created the world. So why do we start with the doctrine of scripture rather than maybe something that might be a little bit more exciting to people? It's because that without scripture, objective truth about God and salvation can't be known. That's, that's in, your, uh, in your notes there. Without scripture, objective truth about God and salvation cannot be known. If we're not careful, if we don't know scripture, because we can't, we can't stop with general revelation. We start there, but then we go to special revelation, and we have to have salvation understanding through general or special revelation. Through that, that's how we can then have truth. Here you go. Sorry, I don't mean to be making such a big fuss there. Okay, 
let me give a couple of statements, and then if you have uh, any questions about the statements or if you have questions about things that we've talked about thus far, we'll take a moment and just get those questions, all right? So I want to make sure that this is interactive. So here's three statements that I think that we can learn from why we're studying the doctrine of Scripture, especially general and special revelation. First statement, general revelation means everyone without exception throughout all of human history is morally responsible to God for their sins and are therefore under the wrath of God. Okay? Does that make sense? It's a long statement. But basically, it's saying nobody has excuse. Nobody has an excuse. Second statement. Every human instinctively knows there is a God, though it might be a wrong God, and they might not worship the one true God. So R.C. Sproul, for instance, wrote a book on this, that there are really no true atheists, that instinctively we all know there's a God, it's just... For instance, atheists have said, well, I don't want to believe in that God, right? So agnostics, for instance, uh, there's, there's a lot of debate here, but how we understand scripture is that there is something within us that knows there's a God. Now we can reject that, which leads then to the third statement here, rejection of instinctive foundational truths, such as the reality of the one true God or the truths about this God lead to a muted conscience and that's the acceptance of non-realities such as atheism or sexual perversions, and thus leads to Isaiah 5.20, calling evil good and good evil. So these are three statements that based on what we understand from general revelation and then what we're going to get into in special revelation, we have to come to these conclusions that this is what Scripture says. So I want to give a moment here, and I'm not going to belabor the point, but if there is something in your mind, if you have a question that you think would be helpful for the group, uh, just walk on up here and don't be shy and ask a question and we'll do our best to answer it. <laughs> Sorry, Tammy, we thought about putting one over there. We'll have to do that next time. I have a tendency to ask a lot of questions. <laughs> So when you talk about the re re revelation of salvation, mm -hmm. of course we know that comes from hearing God's word um, and preaching and, and um, hearing the gospel, of course. So my yeah. question is, how did that revelation of salvation apply back in the old, Old Testament? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, Paul helps us answer that in Romans chapter 4. Uh, in Romans 4, it talks about Abraham was justified by works, he was justified by what? His faith. What did he have faith in? Well, his faith was through the spoken word of God, right? So God, uh, in the Old Testament times, so when the canon of Scripture was not closed, so Scripture was still being written, uh, God was speaking directly to Abraham, speaking directly to Moses, speaking directly to Joseph. I mean, these are, these are, God was speaking to his people. The neat thing is, God's still speaking to us today, it's just codified and canonized in, in this word. So um, <laughs> I, I heard somebody once say, if you want to see God's words, read the Bible. If you want to hear God's word, read the Bible out loud. <laughs> and I, th I think that's a good, a good quote. Um, because God was speaking to his people in the Old Testament, and they had faith in the promises of what God spoke to them. And you and I have confidence and assurance in the promises that are from the written word of God. So the redemption, salvation from his word, special revelation, was quite literally the spoken word of God. You and I have the written word of God. There's no difference. It's the word of God. Great question. Other questions? Round two. Okay, perfect. Okay, well, I don't want to belabor the point, so let's keep going. Um, I have a lot of content tonight, <laughs> so we're just going to keep moving along. If there are any questions at any point, though, man, I want to I talk about it, because I want to make sure that we're understanding the significance of what we're doing, why we're doing it, and uh, what this means for your life. So page two, uh, we're going to be getting into the seven principles of the doctrine of Scripture, seven principles of the doctrine of Scripture, and this is really how we understand scripture. So I'm trying to start broadly with understanding of God, general revelation, then now hone into special revelation. That's God's word specifically, made some statements about that. Um, but let me give, well, I'm gonna say a couple of things before I get into the seven principles, but let me just put this up here. How you view life is directly related to how you view scripture. 
I mentioned it this morning, and uh, for those of you wonderful souls who spent the afternoon with me, you've just been getting a lot of Pastor Jeremiah today with the uh, teacher training and then coming back. We talked about authority, right? And so we, we talked about hermeneutics. How you understand scripture helps you understand where you believe authority is. So how you view scripture is going to dictate how you live your life. Because if you think that you're the one who needs to do what's best for your life, I want to make myself happy, I want to follow my dreams, I want to do all of these things that are on your heart and in your mind, instead of looking to scripture for your guide, then, then that's going to tell us a lot about how you view God and, and ultimately how you view scripture. And so we need to start uh, with this idea of we need to know how we view scripture is going to determine how you live your life when you go to work tomorrow. It's going to affect how you interact uh, with your friends and with your family. It's all going to depend on your understanding of Scripture. Let me say one other thing here that I'm going to give a warning before I get into these seven principles. Our faith will rise or fall depending on our understanding of Scripture. Um, and I don't mean to be some, um, you know, uh, crier that's out ringing a bell, warning of crying wolf or anything like that. Uh, but history bears witness to this truth. If we lose the truthfulness of Scripture, and if we reject these seven principles that I'm going to give you here over the next hour, and if we lose what God has said about his word, then we will inevitably lose God himself. And if you lose God himself, you've lost your salvation, or you never had salvation to begin with. Um, so let me just give you uh, an understanding or an example of this. And um, I was just absolutely shocked. And maybe I shouldn't be. But isn't it amazing how quickly degressing our culture is? Um, it wasn't that long ago that I saw a church uh, online. Uh, they were doing a worship service. Um, and uh, I was just amazed that it was Transgender Sunday and this church had a drag queen reading books to the children while they had church online, um, which is a very bizarre thing to experience, um, to say the least. How, do we get, how did we get there, right? How did we get to that point? How do we get to churches who say that they're churches of Jesus Christ, and yet they say there's many ways to salvation in Jesus Christ? Um, how do we get to a point where what Isaiah says that our churches are calling evil good and good evil from Scripture, plainly. Well, it, it has everything to do with this. Uh, our faith rises and falls depending on our understanding of Scripture. And let me give you just a little historical understanding of this. Um, there, was a, there was a man that lived um, you know, 300 years ago, very little-known man called Thomas Jefferson. Have you ever heard of him? <laughs> So what was he, our third president, something like that? Um, Thomas Jefferson, he was a son of the Enlightenment, right? So he, a lot of, like a lot of our founding fathers, were deists, uh, but they believed, especially Thomas Jefferson, that they were an, he was a naturalist, so he only believed in what he could explain. So you know what Thomas Jefferson did? He opened up his Bible, and he took out a pair of scissors, and he cut out the things in the Bible that he just didn't think were possible, especially in the Gospels. Jesus walking on water, no, couldn't happen, right? Uh, I've never seen anybody walk on water, so I don't believe that. Uh, Jesus healing people, never seen that. So he cut out, it's called the Jefferson Bible, cutting out the things of the miraculous, being a naturalist. Well, this is because of the Enlightenment, and it goes even beyond that, but I'm just going back to the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment had this thinking when it came to Scripture called higher biblical criticism, which essentially said that you, the interpreter, have the authority to understand what is right and what is not right about Scripture. You have the right to determine what's truth. And of course, this has devastating effects when we think we have the authority. So let me just give you an example here of one of the devastating effects from what this looked like. Uh, Friedrich Schulemacher, he was a German theologian. His years were 1768 to 1834. Schulemacher was a huge person in higher biblical criticism. He got to the point where he had deconstructed Scripture so much from what he didn't believe was right because he believed him to be the arbiter this is what he said, and I'm sorry if it's hard to read. 
He said, I cannot believe, speaking of Jesus, I cannot believe that he, Jesus, who called himself the son of man, was the true eternal God. I cannot believe that his death was a vicarious atonement because he never expressly said so himself. And I cannot believe it to have been necessary because God, who evidently did not create men for perfection, but for the pursuit of it, cannot possibly intend to punish them eternally because they have not attained it, perfection. That's a man who's lost the gospel. That's a man who's lost hope. That's a man who has nothing any longer because he looked at the word of God and he determined, I am the one who gives that meaning and I don't think that it's right what it says. This is such an important issue. If we rightly understand Scripture as it articulates itself and we gather the meaning from Scripture itself, we will be on the right road. But when we think that we are the ones that have the authority or that we are the ones who have to understand Scripture and give it meaning, then we're going to end up like Schulamacher. And friends, Schulamacher was not the only one. Schulamacher started a really long line of progression that a lot of denominations have followed. It's the removal of biblical meaning from God and putting it in the hands of the person who's reading it. And it's led to devastating consequences. So how have we gotten in a society to a point where we have transgenderism in church, for instance? It's at least in part and parcel because of this. It's no longer God's word says, it's what we think God's word ought to say or what we are reinterpreting it to say. So these seven principles are very important. So let's jump into them. Seven principles. The very first principle is a foundational principle. It's what we might call a baseline principle, drawing from general and special revelation that we talked about at the very beginning. This goes or flows right into that first thing here. Without scripture, we cannot know God or be saved. What scripture helps us know about itself is, again, from the very beginning that we talked about, special revelation is essential that if there was no word of God given to us by God, then we wouldn't have a way of knowing God fully and certainly wouldn't have a way of knowing God in salvation, right? Now, so this helps us understand, for instance, John chapter one very well. Uh, John chapter one says this, in the beginning was the word. For those of you who, who love studying scripture, that, that word, word is logos. That's the Greek word. So in the beginning was the logos, the word. And the logos, the word was with God, and the logos was God. And so this word logos that talks about Jesus is the same Greek word throughout the New Testament to describe scripture. So that's always the word that pops up when we're talking about scripture. The word of God is Jesus. And what Jesus has said is redemption through the blood of himself, which helps us know how to be saved. And that's what's articulated within Scripture. So when we talk about the necessity of Scripture, what we're saying is it's Jesus who was the very mouthpiece of God, speaking the words of God, because he is the word of God, we now know what he has said. Does that make sense? And because we know what God has said, we now know how to be saved. We now know this great God. It's all because these are the words that came from Jesus. The, the idea here is we have no hope, we have no direction, we have no salvation without scripture. So Psalm 119 verses 105 says, your word is a lamp to my feet. You learned this in Awana, didn't you? Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I don't know about you, but without a light, I can't walk. If there's not a light to guide my path, I'm falling off into the ditch. God's word is absolutely essential that's why every time we get together, we're trying to articulate and understand what scripture means. Because otherwise, I don't know how to live my life. Sure, I can try to do good things, but it won't be pleasing to God if I'm not doing it for his purposes. God's word is necessary because it's the very words of God through the word of God, Jesus Christ, to guide us in this life. But we can't just stop with this idea of the necessity of scripture. We really need to say that scripture is the most precious, prized and cherished possession for a Christian. If we just say it's necessary, we kind of say, yeah, okay, that, that sounds good. But I love this word precious because each and every one of us have something that's precious to us. It might be your old car. It might be something that's handed down from your parents or grandparents. It might be your children or grandchildren. The most precious possession in the world to the Christian is the very words of God from the word of God, Jesus Christ. 
This is more significant. This is more important than anything else in this life because when we have the word of God, we can know God as he is. Isn't it striking to you that for millennia, for thousands of years, Christians have died just to hold what you're just casually holding in your hands? That's precious. There are people today in parts of the world who die just to have this just to read a couple of verses, just to know what God has said. God's word is necessary because it teaches us of who God is, it teaches us of salvation, and it's the most precious thing because it guides our life. Let me show you a couple of uh, verses here. Psalm chapter 19, verses 9 through 10. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. Hear this now. They are more desirable than gold. Yes, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Fill in the blank of whatever you really love in life. Money, satisfaction, pleasures, fill it in. Say, scripture's more significant to me than that. It's more precious to me than that. Psalm chapter 119, verse 72. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. I wonder if we could say that if we're single, the word of God is more powerful and wonderful to me than finding a spouse. The word of God is more significant to me than having children who obey me. The word of God is more precious to me than being in a really, really easy, comfortable marriage. The the word of God is more precious to me than being rich or at least having more money. Is the word of God precious to you? Psalm 119, or... Whoa, goodness gracious. Is that Psalm, yeah, 119 verse 92. That should be 119 verse 92. If your law had not been my delight, then I would have perished in my affliction. Psalm 119 verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Do you hear how God's word says about itself? It's necessary. Now, this should be really convicting to us. Because a lot of times, if you're like me, it's easy to not treat God's word like it's just absolutely vital to your life. And we, that's evidenced by the fact that some of us have entered today, and it's been more than a week since we've read God's word for ourselves. It's, it's evidenced by the fact that we can quote a whole lot more of our favorite show or our favorite song rather than we can quote of scripture. We have meditated on that conversation we had with a friend more than meditating on the very words of God. God's word must be necessary more than anything else in your life. That's where a Christian has to start. I want to give you an example of this. Uh, If you've never heard of the woman Lady Jane Grey, um, you should get to know her. She is a woman of the faith who is an amazing example of godliness. Uh, When Sadie, Judah, and I went to London a couple years back, uh, we went to the Tower of London, which is where a lot of people were beheaded, and Lady Jane Grey was one of them in the 1500s. She was queen for nine days, and Bloody Mary, her sister, half-sister, I think, um, executed her uh, because she was scared that uh, Lady Jane Grey would would take control. And so before Lady Jane Grey was beheaded, she left a note in her Bible for her sister, And this isn't all of it, but I want to give you at least part of it. And again, I'm sorry that it's small print here. But listen to the preciousness of God's word from a dying lady. She said, and I quote, "I, I have here sent you, good sister Catherine, a book, which although it be not outwardly trimmed with gold, yet inwardly it is more worth than precious stones. It is the book, dear sister, of the law of the Lord. It is his testament and last will, which he bequeathed unto us wretches, which shall lead you to the path of eternal joy. And if you with a good mind read it, and with an earnest mind do purpose to follow it, it shall bring you to an immortal and everlasting life. It shall teach you to live and learn to die. It shall win you more than you should have gained by the possession of your woeful father's lands. For as if God had prospered him, you should have inherited his lands. So if you apply diligently this book, seeking to direct your life after it, you shall be an inheritor of such riches as neither thief shall steal, neither the moths corrupt. Desire with David, dear sister, to understand the law of the Lord. You know, imagine 
You're going to die the next day, and that's the note you're leaving. That's the preciousness. That's the necessity of God's word. Oh, I'm so sorry. (laughs) There were two slides there. The Puritan Valley of Vision, this is a prayer from one of the Puritans, said, help me lift up the gates of my soul that he may come in and show me himself when I search the scriptures, for I have no lines to fathom its depths, no wings to soar to its heights. By his aid, may I be enabled to explore all its truths, love them with all my heart, embrace them with all my power, and graft them into my life. Then write thy own words upon my heart and inscribe them on my lips. So so shall all glory be to thee in my reading of thy word. Friends, this is the heart of the believer who understands if this is the revelation of salvation, then it's more precious than anything else. Do you hear how necessary God's word ought to be and how we must grow in our necessity of understanding the importance of God's word? So let me give you just a couple of application statements. And these are, again, in your your notes. But how we view, understand, and believe of God's word shapes all of our life. Whether you view scripture as necessary or not, whether you live your life in light of the preciousness of scripture will dictate and shape all of your life. Um, The Puritan Nathaniel Vincent once wrote, he who despises the word of God and its commands is not sincerely converted, but damnably deluded. Which leads me to say, rejection of God's word is rejection of God and his salvation. I am making a very strong statement that if you reject this, you're rejecting God. And there are many people in our nation who go to churches who would disagree with that who would disagree with that. But I think that that's what scripture says. So I want to make a a point to stop here. And uh, if you have questions that you've been writing down or something that you think would be beneficial to ask and to to consider, then, then let's take a few moments to ponder those. Okay. An easy crowd. I think you've got more questions, so make sure, if you've got them, then make sure to ask them when we, when we get to the next stoppage. First principle, the necessity, the preciousness of the word of God. Let's go then to the inspiration of scripture. So if the necessity of scripture is this understanding of, of that it should matter to us, This thing called the inspiration of Scripture tells us how we have received God's Word. And this is one of the most important things. When we talk about inspiration, we're talking about the way in which we have received this Bible. So how did we get from God this? What's what's the way that that took place? How did that happen? So this this is in your notes, and of course I want you to be able to see it for yourself. Inspiration is the divine process, so that means it's a God-driven process, through human authors of receiving and recording God's word. So their human authors are involved in this process. Over and above this process is the divine. This is God himself. And this is a recording of the words of God. So how did this take place? Let me give you three statements uh, helping us to understand how this inspiration took place. First, inspiration is God's revelation of himself as, now here's the most important thing, the ultimate source. Circle that ultimate source in your notes because that's what that's what's fo- we're focusing here at the very beginning. Inspiration means that scripture as a revelation of God comes from God. He is the ultimate source. So I'm wanting to squash any potential thinking that these words are just the thoughts of man. Paul had a really good day, and he was just really motivated, and he said, you know what? I'm just going to write to the church at Rome. I'm just going to write every good thing that I can think of, everything they might need. That's not scripture. This wasn't just Moses thinking, you know, I need to write down genealogy, and you know, I need to write down uh, how we should be doing sacrifices. That's not what scripture is. Scripture is from an ultimate source from God, but don't take my word for it. Take it from Peter, and I don't think I could say it any better than what Peter says here in 2 Peter 1, 19 through 21. This one says, this says it very plainly. Peter says, so we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention 
as to a lamp shining in a dark place. That sounds like Psalm 119, doesn't it? Until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. That's salvation. But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. Verse 21 of 2 Peter 1, listen to this. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men, catch this, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. And Peter, Peter's just laying this out here, right? He's anticipating that we're wondering, where are these words coming from? Is this just a really good day from these people? Peter's helping us understand, no, this has nothing to do with Paul and James and Mark and Matthew. They, these guys just thinking these things and thinking they need to record them. This is from God himself. That's why he says in verse 21, they're men moved by the Holy Spirit who spoke from God. If we're going to fail and miss in inspiration, may we not miss this understanding that the words that have come to us have come to us from God. That's why Paul would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 21, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Nobody would write these words but God himself. The cross is utter foolishness without the Holy Spirit within you. It makes no sense. No human would ever write this. But to us who are being saved, we're becoming more like Christ. It's the power of God. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. Check this out. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. God knows that in our human thinking and in our human wisdom, in thinking of the flesh, I'm not going to be interested in the cross. Why would I? I'm going to do things myself. I, I am the authority of my life. I'm going to pursue my dreams, my thoughts, what I think will make me happy. It's foolishness to think that my only hope comes from Jesus Christ dying for my sins so that it's nothing that I have done, but everything that he has done. Salvation makes no sense unless you are the divine. So scripture does not come from somebody just deciding this is a good thing to say. Scripture in itself comes from the very mind of God. Think about that for a second. You are getting an insight into the incomparable God's mind when you read scripture. Next time you read the Bible and you think it's boring, Think about what you're saying. You're saying you think the mind of God is boring. It's a scary proposition to make. Second thing about inspiration. Not only is God the ultimate source, but inspiration helps us to see that Scripture is the involvement of human authors. Circle involvement of human authors, if you would. Scripture is the involvement of human authors receiving God's word. God, in his providential plan, determined that humans would be the medium or the means to bring about his words. Do you remember what Jesus says in Luke chapter 19? He says that if these people don't speak about me, he says even the rocks will cry out. Do you remember that? So creation could talk about God. Creation could cry out about Jesus Christ, but that's not what God chose to do. God chose to use you and me to proclaim the message given to biblical authors who wrote it down. God did not decide to make a tree go Lord of the Rings and start writing down things. If you watch Lord of the Rings, those trees are crazy. It wasn't about creation doing it. It was about the highest pivotal part of creation, the image of God being used to write down the words of God. So that's why Paul would say in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, that faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. It's humans that God has used. Human obedience, absolutely. But it's God working through the minds of his people to bring about the words that we know as scripture. Now, this is also very clear that I need to be, make very clear as well. Whereas we want to make sure that this is not just, Scripture is not just men writing things down because they just really want to write something. That could have error in it. Scripture is also not what is call, commonly called the dictation theory of inspiration, which says that Paul was just a robot, that he went into a trance and he woke up and Romans was laying before him. That, that's not the case. And how do we know that's not the case? Have you noticed that Romans sounds a little bit different than 1 Peter? 
Have you noticed that the writing of James is different than the writing of Hebrews? Why is that? Is God just in a different mood and so he decided to do it this way with this guy and this way with this guy? No, the human authors are different. James was different than Paul, was different than Peter. They had different understandings. They had different training. They had different thought processes. So when you read the Gospel of Luke and when you read Acts, notice how detailed the author gives, especially medical issues. You notice that? It's because Luke, the author of both the Luke and the Acts, he was a medical doctor. So he understood biological aspects. So he wrote about it. You read Peter in the original Greek, First and Second Peter, guess what? He sounds like a fisherman because it's what he was. It was very basic. It's not classical Greek. You read Paul, it's classical Greek. Why? Because he was a trained Pharisee. Hopefully what I'm trying to encourage you is that God, yes, is the ultimate source, but he superimposed, he managed the minds of the biblical author through his spirit in the minds of the authors to where he used their personality, but he brought the words to their mind that poured out onto paper. They were involved, but they're not the source, God is, but God used them as the medium to write it. Does that make sense? So we want to make sure we get that right, because if we get that wrong, we'll fall into different heresies that we don't have time to go into. But we do want to say, if all of this is true, then we have a name for what this inspiration is. And I would circle plenary verbal inspiration. That is the official, I guess you could say academic term for an understanding, an orthodox understanding of inspiration. What does plenary verbal mean? It means that the complete word of God was breathed out and inspired by God. Plenary verbal, so plenary is all or complete. That's what that word means, all or complete. Verbal are words, all of the words that have been poured out onto the pages of Scripture have been placed there by God. And notice how we say they are breathed out or inspired by God. That comes, of course, from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. I love these verses. Love them. Check it out. It says, all scripture is inspired. The Greek word there literally means breathed out. I, I don't know if it's quite like this, but I think of God being there with Paul and <sighs> breathing the words into his mind, breathing it into his pen. It's breathed out by God, and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. I'm not going to get into the sufficiency yet of Scripture that, go, that is being expressed here, but friends, you should be seeing the necessity of Scripture, and you should be seeing the inspiration of Scripture. So if only humans were the author, then we could say, well, there's errors here. How do we have any confidence that it's right? But if humans weren't involved, well, then we would say, does God use us in any special way? What is this idea of faith and obedience? So it's perfectly woven together, this idea of God working through humans to bring about his word. Now, time is going to get short on us very quickly. But I'm just going to go with everything I've got, okay? Do I have your permission with that? There's a potential problem here that we want to make sure that we avoid. We want to make sure that we avoid um, the pit of thinking that what we have is not true or it's not real or it's not perfectly inspired. And so this is something that we have to at least address. We have to understand that the original manuscripts of Scripture are inspired but not the translations. I'm thinking that for some of us, this is the first time we've heard it, and so I just want to be very clear as much as possible. The Greek, the Aramaic, and the Hebrew, those are the original languages of the Old and New Testament. Those are the manuscripts. So what Paul wrote down on and then was copied by scribes in the original language, that is the inspired word of God. But by its very definition, a translation cannot be that. Now, if you know two languages, you know why that's the way, right? So if you know Spanish, for instance, you know that there's a, not a one-to-one -one correlation for every word in English to Spanish, or French, or German, or whatever you took in high school, right? There, there is a phrase, lost in translation, that's because a translation 
at best, is trying to get at the idea being said in another language. And so what we have to understand here is if you are an English speaker, which, great, so am I, that we are reading a translation, not the original manuscript, which means we are trusting that men and women have done the accurate work with the original manuscripts to communicate and convey the same ideas in another language. Now, this is where it gets really hairy, and I want to um, give you an example of this. This is going to sound so ridiculous if you've never heard this before. Uh, Colossians 3.12. This is in the NASB, the New American Standard Bible. That's a translation I use. So this is what Colossians 3.12 says. It makes perfect sense to us, right? So as those who have been chosen by God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Makes perfect sense. No problem. It might be hard to do that, but we understand it. The original Greek is a lot more difficult to understand here. And so I'm giving, this is a more literal translation of the original Greek. Therefore, the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on an intestine of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Is there a word that doesn't seem to fit there in your mind? Another word from intestine could be spleen. Uh, the Greek word gets to, the, uh, to put it very to put it very bluntly, your bowels, okay? That's the Greek word here. So that's a problem for us because you and I have no comprehension of our intestines or our spleen or our bowels doing anything other than what is biologically necessary for us to continue surviving. But the word heart has a whole lot more meaning than just a biological reality, right? You see, in the ancient Greek and in the first century, the seat of your affections or the very center of your being was not your heart, it was your bowels. I'm not gonna get into why that's the case, but that's what it was. So the original hearers, when they read the church in Colossae, when they would have read this, they would have understood compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, that's gotta be at the very core of your being. How do you and I understand it when we see heart? Same thing. So now, a translator, a group of translators, they took the original Greek and they changed it. They did. There's a Greek word for heart and that wasn't it. They decided, they made an executive decision that to keep the meaning of the text, they're going to change the word. Because what the original hearers would have understood is now what you understand when you see that word. So when we ask, is the translation, the NASB, wrong to say heart, well, yes, if we're talking about being literal to the text, they were wrong. But if we're saying that were they wrong in getting the meaning of the text, we would say no, they were right. Because otherwise, you would have no idea if the word said bowels, what on earth that means. And by the way, if you use the King James, it says bowels. So that might be a little bit more difficult for us to understand. So the idea here is we have to get translations that are faithful to the meaning and as literal as possible to the meaning. So let me just put it this way. Translations with less interpretation is more trustworthy. The NASB and almost every other translation made an interpretation of Colossians 3.12. I think they were right in doing that. But always go to translations that are not going to try to change it to make it more palatable or understandable try to find a translation that's going to be as literal as possible, except where we're going to be completely lost because of an original language. These, this is my opinion, this is not gospel, but the three translations that I would use that I think are quite good, I preach out of the NASB every single week. That's my translation that I've been using for many years. The ESV is another good translation, and there's a new translation, the CSB, which is also quite good. I'm sure that there could be some more that go uh, in there, um, the New King James is good in, in different ways as well. Uh, I generally steer clear away from the King James because it's harder for me to fully comprehend and understand all of the verbiage uh, in it. And I think that some actual things are better in some of the other translations. So when we talk about inspiration, what we're talking about is God using the mind of biblical authors being the source speaking into their authors in the original manuscripts that in a translation such as what you and I have in English you and I are saying we believe that God's word is still truthful, even though it's in a different, uh, it's a, in a different um, 
what do we call it? Language. Yeah, different language. So let me give then two statements and open it up for uh, a question or thoughts if you have them. Uh, so since God is the author of Scripture, we don't have the right to question, doubt, or reject anything that God has said. That gets to the heart of inspiration. God is the one who has brought everything into Scripture, all of it. So we don't get to pick and choose, as we'll see here in a moment. God is the one who is the source of everything in Scripture. So you don't get to say, well, I don't like that. Well, it's from God, so you better like it. Uh, second statement, faithful translations inspire confidence and biblical accuracy. Interpretive translations allow for loss of divine meaning. And don't make any mistake, there are some translations who lose the meaning of the text because they are interpretively wrong. So we need to make sure we use the right ones. Okay, so I'm going to open this up now, uh, talking about inspiration. Uh, any thoughts or uh, questions that might be in your mind? So in... I'm just a little taller than that. So, so in knowing, Jeremiah, to get down to the crux of it, what is a very good translation in what may be a murky or watered-down translation or one that has completely missed the mark, what kind of sources do you use or what have you used in the past and what, what advice to anybody else searching for an, an alternate uh, translation as you study? What, what sort of sources can you look just to make sure that they are very sound in what they're doing? Again, trusting the, the uh, translators of the original text. So kind of what practical advice would I give? Yes. Yeah, good question, Bill. Um, here's what I would say. An easy out would be to trust somebody who you know has done the work of, of learning and doing the background. Uh, so if you have somebody that you would say, I really trust this person, they, they seem to really be thinking biblically and accurately, that could at least be a good starting point, and I would start with them. Uh, I would go to the group of translators. So you can, you can find out uh, most translations have uh, either the list of the people who are on the committee, uh, or you can for sure find it online, um, of just going to see who are these people and um, what, what have they done so far? Um, what, how can I understand their theology based on what their published works? Uh, so there have been some translations where there are some questionable committee members that the things that they have published throw into question perhaps their motives in, in uh, their translations. So... Um, that would be a good way of going about it. I would also compare translations. Um, so if you were part of the teaching meeting that I had uh, this afternoon, Bible Hub is a website, uh, biblehub.com that I mentioned. You can go there and see the original Greek and Hebrew, and you can see it word for word. So this word has this translation. And you can go and compare the translations to the original Greek comparison. Um, I will just say this, I use the NASB, and here's the knock that I would give to NASB. Um, it's kind of wooden at times. By that I mean it doesn't always have the easiest flow in English, because it's really trying to be literal. Um, so it, it makes the necessary adjustments if we just couldn't understand a Hebrew idiom, for instance. But most of the time, it's going to put, it's going to try to be as absolutely accurate word for word as possible with the original language. And then you, as the hearer or as the studier, have to do the work of, well, this doesn't quite flow as well as maybe another translation that takes more artistic license. Um, I would rather do the whole myself instead of having to trust somebody else who's tried to soften the edges of the English language. I don't really prefer somebody to do that for me. I'd rather do that myself. So does that give couple of thoughts on that. Um, I mean, ultimately, we're having to trust that what has been passed down to us has been faithful to God's word, right? Um, but God, he's not going to fail his word. He's just not. So we must be wise, but we must also trust in him. Any other uh, questions? Yeah, the NASB has come out with a newer translation. I don't, I haven't really done in-depth research on the new NASB translation. I've stuck to the 1995, in part because that's what my Bible is. Um, I would want to look to see what did they change 
So like NIV came out with a TNIV, if you're familiar with that. Uh, notice what are the things that they're changing? What are they updating? Uh, so one of the things that they really tried to move was um, taking out gendered language. Uh, that's kind of problematic. Um, if there is gendered language in scripture, if it's saying men and then it's changed to person, that's probably not being very faithful to the text. So uh, you just have to make sure that you're doing your research on it. And I would recommend, I mean, if you want to ask me about any translation, perhaps you have a favorite translation that you use, I'd be happy to let you know what I think about it, what I know about it. I might not know everything about that translation, but uh, it certainly warrants knowing what translation do you use? Is it a good translation? Because I'll just put it this way. If you can think of like a, a rainbow, like a big spectrum, some are on this side, some are on this side, some are in the middle. You need to know where your Bible translation is on that spectrum. Literal, super interpretive, or somewhere in the middle. You need to know where your translation's at. Okay. Here's a topic. Um, so this is what we've been talking about of inspiration. So we're about to go to inerrancy, but when we talk about inspiration on that left circle, we have a thought in the mind of God which leads then to the mind of the human author of Scripture, which leads then to the original Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic at times manuscripts, which then leads us to this idea of inerrancy. And I am going to do my hardest. <laughs> I looked at the clock and realized we got 20 minutes. I'm going to do my hardest, guys. I will. But we'll just keep going, and those online will just stick with us too. The inerrancy of Scripture. So inspiration from the mind of God to the mind of man, then to the manuscripts. So that leads us to this idea of inspiration. So when we talk about inspiration, we're building from what we've already said about the necessity of Scripture, that this is where we know about salvation and truth. We see that Scripture is the product of the mind of God, the human authors. And now thirdly, with inerrancy, this is what we're saying, that Scripture is completely true without any errors. That's what we're saying. We're saying that according to God's Word itself, God who has no errors or faults within him, in his word also has no faults. It is perfect, it is complete, it is not lacking in anything. Everything that has been said is right and good and perfect. That is a complete statement, and I believe this so much that I would die for this. Because I think if we lose this, then we're gonna lose God himself. And because I think this is, I mean, this is what scripture says about itself. Psalm 19, 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Praise God, I am a simpleton. It makes me wise because his word is perfect. I don't know how you can come to any other conclusion than what is said there. John 17, 17, Jesus is praying his high priestly prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he says, sanctify them in truth to the Father. Sanctify them because your word is truth. By its very definition, truth does not have any error. That's why it's truth. Titus 1, 2 says, in hope of eternal life, which God who never lies has promised before the ages began. Hebrews 6, 18 says, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. Proverbs 35, every word of God proves true. I mean, I don't know how to say it any more plainly than that. Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Friends, how you view scripture must be determined or at least deeply affected by understanding that if God is a perfect God, and if God is the one who is the author of Scripture, because Scripture is from the mind of God, then therefore the words that he has given coming from the word of God, Jesus, there can be no errors, right? Now that's going to have some big implications. That means everything that God says is right and good and applicable. So that means that you and I can't pull a Thomas Jefferson. You and I can't decide what we want to follow, what we think is good, and what we think we should focus on. We have to focus on all of it because it's all equally right and true. So here's the next point. Only a perfect and reliable source of truth can determine reality. Um, here's an existential argument that I don't want to spend too much time on. Um, but if God is the one who's behind Scripture, then therefore, 
He is the one who can determine reality, not us. If God is the God of truth, then what he says is right is reality, not what we say is right. So let me just say this very quickly, and this is a philosophical debate, and I I try to dip into philosophy every now and then. You and I do not determine reality. We can't, because you and I have a condition from birth known as sin. And so when you and I think that we are the ones who decide what reality is, we will always fall off the cliff. Now, we know that if I give you a really ridiculous analogy. Um, If there was somebody who was in here, and, and this guy was on opioids, right? And he's just high on drugs. And he tells you that over there is a pink unicorn. Are you gonna believe him? But in that moment, does he not truly believe that's reality? He has a condition that he's under the influence of a foreign substance, right? You and I, this is a ridiculous example, but you and I are under the influence of the condition of sin. You and I do not perceive in our humanity reality such as it truly is. That's why we live in chaos. That's why the world is the way that it is. It perceives to be reality the pink unicorn. And when you see the truth of the inerrancy of God that says, no, 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 no. The truth is not what we claim it to be and what we think it to be, but the truth is from what God's word says. We say the pink unicorn's not really there. So that's why when we have conversations, for instance, about uh, biblical sexuality, you're gonna lose unbelievers just like that because they're not looking at reality. And I don't mean this to sound dismissive, because all of us were there before Christ. The only hope that we have of understanding rightly reality is when we see the one true God who has given the one true truth of what reality actually is. And if we reject that, then we fall into postmodernism, and that's where our culture is at. In fact, we're actually post-postmodern. So postmodernism says that if I am happy doing something, then it must be good. And if you're happy doing something, it must be good. So you do whatever makes you happy and I'll do whatever makes me happy. We're actually beyond that now to where you must agree with me about what makes me happy. And if you don't, then you're gonna get canceled, right? Or you're going to be removed or you're gonna get fired or you're gonna whatever. It's post-postmodern. It's not even looking at reality as it actually is because the only way that you can have reality of what it really truly is is when you have the inerrancy, a word of God that tells us what is actually right and true. Otherwise, we don't have any standard of objective truth. Everything becomes subjective depending upon what you like in that moment. And again, reverting back to the, the man who's on drugs uh, illustration, it makes no sense. It makes absolutely none. We're seeing pink unicorns everywhere when we think sin is our reality. Tell, tell that to your kids, right? That's a good, a good illustration about inerrancy. So let me give you a couple of implications from the inerrancy of Scripture that this is our only way of understanding objective truth. An, an implication of inerrancy is subjective experience must be understood through objective truth. I'm going to say that again. Please put a star or highlight or something. This subjective experience must be understood through objective truth. Your subjective experience matters, but it is not perfect. It is not inerrant. Okay? Let me give you a quick illustration of this. If you and I uh, see a crash, a car crash, and I'm on one side of the street and you're on the other side of the street, We both witness the same event take place. You and I are going to have a lot of the same things that we would agree upon, but would you not agree we'll also see some things differently? We have a different perspective. But if you and I both look at a police report that is completely articulating every detail of what happened, and we look at that report and say, oh yeah, I remember seeing that. I remember that. And the lens of our understanding become this whole inclusive police report. That's the idea of scripture. That your experience matters, but only when you relate it to and submit it to the objective truth of God's word. And if you do it the other way around, then you lose truth altogether. In fact, if you do it the other way around, that I view scripture through the lens of my experience rather than viewing the 
my experience is through the lens of scripture, you will be destroyed when God doesn't do what you want him to do. So uh, this morning in the pastoral prayer time, we prayed for the Holton family. Uh, if, you, if you remember me praying for them, uh, it's, a, it's a family back in St. Louis that uh, Sadie and I know. We, we know the grandparents, their nine-year-old grandson. He was just a normal kid three days ago, and then he just fell over with brain bleeding, and he's, he's dying. He's going to die. Um, so if they are viewing that experience, and I don't mean to be callous here. I'm being very, trying to be very applicable if they are viewing that experience and then trying using that experience to view scripture, how would they see the goodness of God in that? I wouldn't. How could it be good for my little nine-year-old son to no longer be here anymore? If I'm viewing scripture through the lens of my experience, God is no longer good. But what if I switch? And what if I look at my experience through the lens of scripture? It helps me see a God who is bigger than I am helps me see a plan that is a bigger mosaic than the tiny aspect that I can see right now. It helps me have an eternity mindset. I will one day go be with that child. He won't come back to me, but like David, I will go to him. That's an understanding of our subjective experience in light through the lens of the objective inerrant truth of God's word. By the way, can I just put this to how you view yourself? Your understanding of yourself should not come before scripture, but scripture helps you interpret your own feelings and your own self-image and how you understand yourself. It's huge, huge implications that we're gonna see for the rest of this year. Another um, implication of inerrancy, I've got three of them here. All of scripture is true. All of scripture applies to your life and you need all of scripture. We are really good, are we not, at picking and choosing what we wanna eat picking and choosing the entertainment we want to watch, and picking and choosing the things that we want to follow, and the things that we want to obey. We're much more motivated to follow the things that are easy for us. Well, you know, I don't really struggle with that sin, so I'd rather talk about that. You know, I'm not busy killing people, so yeah, let's talk about uh, this idea of not murdering. That makes good sense. But then what about when it talks about gossip? <laughs> Uh, what about when it talks about your temple being, or your body being a temple for the Lord and not filling it with the junk of the world? Whew. Things start to get a little bit more real, right? Friends, the inerrancy of Scripture means that none of Scripture is wasted. All of it is applicable to you because all of it is true, especially for those in Christ. Then thirdly, third implication here of inerrancy, all truth is consistent with the truth of Scripture here, I want to just make a quick statement uh, that, man, goodness, there's so many avenues that we could go on, and I'm going to try not to follow too many rabbit trails here, but anything in science, anything in history, anything in any secular field, if they come to truth, it's because truth was first articulated here. What I'm trying to say very quickly and very hopefully easily is you don't need the world to tell you the truth about God. If something is truthful, it's truthful in God first. We are living in a day and age where we think that to rightly understand the Christian life and the Christian condition, I have to add something to God's word, a grid that will help me understand it better. And I'm saying, no, no, you do not. Um, so you have a handout here. So this is second handout. Uh, the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy, it might be helpful to know, this was in 1978. Some of the signers include names you might recognize, John MacArthur, R.C. Sproul, J.I. Packer. I've quoted uh, many of them, well, all of them at different times. Article number 12, uh, this is some affirmation, this is an affirmation and denial. This is the structure of this statement. It says in Article 12, we affirm that Scripture in its entirety is inerrant, being free from all falsehood, fraud, or deceit. That's the affirmation. Now, here's the denial. We deny that biblical infallibility, we're going to talk about that just next, and inerrancy are limited to spiritual, religious, or redemptive themes. And
inclusive of assertions in the fields of history and science, we further deny that scientific hypothesis about earth history may properly be used to overturn the teaching of scripture on creation and the flood. If you can't see what I'm going at with this, we're going to eventually talk about creation and evolution. And what I'm trying to say is truth is only truth if it's consistent with scripture. And if it's not, I don't care if science says it's truth. I don't care if history says it's truth. I don't care if astronomy says it's truth. It's not truth if it goes against scripture. Truth is God's truth. So it must be consistent with scripture. Okay. Questions on that? All right. I'm going to keep going. We're going to trek along. These next ones, really, if we understand inspiration and inerrancy, I think the rest of these will go a little bit more quickly. So the next one is infallibility. This is very close to inerrancy, very similar. Whereas inerrancy says that there are no errors in Scripture, infallibility says that it is incapable of error. Okay, so very close. And in one sense, we're kind of splitting hairs here. Inerrancy says there are no errors in Scripture. Infallibility says it's incapable of having errors, and this is why this matters. You need to be seeing the God who is incapable of having any error. Not only does Scripture not have error, but the God behind Scripture, it's not even possible. It's not even in the realm of our hypothetical minds of thinking that God could have error. Therefore, it's not even in the realm of possibility that God's word would have any mistakes. Scripture affirms this just like inerrancy. Uh, Psalm 12, 6, the words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace on the earth refined seven times. Hebrews 4.12, one of the deacons is memorizing this, I love it. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God not only has no error within him, but he's not even capable of having error within him. Therefore, so too is his word. It not only doesn't have error, it's incapable of having error. Here's another Chicago statement on biblical inerrancy. This is Article 11, so if you still have that open or you can see it up here. Again, affirmation and denial on infallibility. We affirm that Scripture, having been given by divine inspiration, is infallible, so that far from misleading us, it is true and reliable in all the matters it addresses. We deny that it is possible for the Bible to be at the same time infallible and inerrant. And er we deny excuse me, that it is possible for the Bible to be at the same time infallible and errant in its assertions. Infallibility and inerrancy may be distinguished, but not separated. They're the twin uh, understanding principles of the word of God. There's no error, nor could there ever be error. Let me give you two statements of application here. If infallibility of Scripture is true, that it is impossible to obtain any or have any error in it, then all of human existence is judged according to the infallible standards of Scripture. Let me tell you something that I cannot stand. I cannot stand when I hear people say, well, this is the 21st century. Okay, that doesn't change anything. God's word hasn't changed from the 20th to the 21st century, hasn't changed from the 1st century. So, so yes, societies change, nations rise and fall, but the word of God remains the same, eternally the same, eternally right. So all of human existence does not change with what is accepted by society or what is approved of by the Supreme Court. All of human existence is judged by the unchanging, infallible, inerrant word of God. It doesn't change nor could it ever change. Second thing that we could say here is either all of Scripture is true or none of it is true. Again, I believe this with all of my heart because I can't read Scripture any other way. You either believe that this is from the mind of God and God is incapable of error and has not given any error or you cannot trust the Word of God. And if you don't trust the Word of God, what assurance do you have of your salvation? What assurance that you're right? Because if it's just based on your feelings, well, this feels right. Well, your feelings are gonna change, but the word of God doesn't. It's either right or it's not right. Okay, any, any questions or thoughts on that? Okay, either I am really good at explaining things 
but you all are really concerned about the time, <laughs> and some of you haven't eaten dinner, and you're concerned that we still have three more principles to go. Well, we'll get through them. The, uh, what is this? The fifth is the authority of Scripture. So Scripture is necessary, inspired, inerrant, infallible, and it is authoritative. So friends, hear this so plainly. Scripture is the final authority over all of your life. This is life-changing if you really understand the implications of it. That all of your behavior must submit not to your feelings or the approval of your friends or your family or the thoughts of what you think is right or good or what social media praises. (laughs) Okay, I'm trying to cover kind of everything there. Scripture is the authority over your life. So you show me how somebody treats God's word as authoritative or not in their life, and I'll show you what that person believes about God because it's a question of authority. Let me give you a couple of verses here. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. We should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in truth. So the authority comes from God's redemptive work in your life and what he's teaching you and growing you in truth. That's the way that you must live your life. Uh, 1 John 5, 9 says, if we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. That's our authority. Not the teaching of man, but the teaching of God. For the testimony of God is this, that he has testified concerning his son. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8 says, The grass withers, the flower fades, the word of God will stand forever. 1 Peter 1 quotes the same thing from Isaiah 40 and says, For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. And then he says in verse 24, Flesh is like grass, But all the glory like the uh, flower of grass, the grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. The authority of human existence and human life is not found outside of anything other than the mind of God given to us through his word. All of God's word is applicable to your life and bears weight and authority over your life. Again, this is going to change everything. It's going to change everything about how we live. The second London Baptist Confession from 1689 says this. I'm just trying to give you not only scripture, but a historical understanding. This is one of the earliest Baptist confessions. It says, The authority of the Holy Scripture for which it ought to be believed dependeth not upon the testimony of any man or church, but wholly upon God, who is truth itself, the author thereof. Therefore, it is to be received because it is the word of God. So let me give a couple of statements here. These are in your notes, but a couple of statements. First, every area of life must submit to the authority of God's word. We have this nasty little habit, and each of us struggle with this in the human life, where we think that the spiritual realm of our life submits to the authority of God, but not our business dealings, not our entertainment, not our time spent on whatever time of the week that is our time. We think that it doesn't apply to the things of our voting habits or the way we spend our money or all of these things. We we relegate the authority of God's word to a nice little bubble of Sunday morning and for you guys, Sunday night. Friends, every area of life must submit to the authority of God without any exception. For the sake of time, let me just move on to the next principle. I have this bad way of just having a ton of information, so I have to cut and condense since I'm past my time already. Second statement is that God's desires are the final authority over your desires, and Scripture details God's desires. Let me give you a real-life scenario that many pastors have faced. What do you do if you're a pastor and somebody comes into your office and says, I'm going to divorce my spouse run away with somebody else because that person makes me happy. What do you do? It's a good start, yeah. Here's what you don't do. Well, if it's going to make you happy, because that's the, that person's greatest desire in that moment, right? They honestly think, because of being blinded by sin, remember reality is skewed with sin, 
They honestly think in that moment, this is the best thing for me. They honestly think that this will make them happy. But better is it to understand, obviously, that God's word says he has the final authority. So it doesn't matter if you have a desire that is outside of God's word. That desire must be put to death. God's word is the authority over your life. Now, we might see that really simply and easily in that not so hypothetical hypothetical scenario that I just gave, but think about your own life. What are your desires that you have in life that sometimes might be outside of God's word? God's desires are the highest authority in your life, not the things in the moment that you want to do the most. Which, by the way, that's how Christians across the world are dying in persecution. Their greatest desire, probably in some of those situations, they probably want to live, but they're willing to die because they understand something far better. They understand God's word and the eternal truths of his word. Here's a third statement. Scripture evokes. Well, that would be no hope, right? wonder if I told you you can only understand 25% of Scripture. That would be devastating to us. But I need to know all of Scripture. The perspicuity of Scripture doesn't mean that every part of Scripture you're going to fully know in every aspect of its being. It doesn't mean that you're fully going to know God in every aspect of His being. And it doesn't mean that every human will fully know and understand God. But it does mean foundationally what you need to know about God, about salvation, and about living a life of obedience, you can understand. I love that. God has made wise the simple. And so he helps us to understand this is what it means to be a believer. This is what it means to live a godly life. You don't have to have a doctorate, praise the Lord. You don't have to have a wealth of commentaries. You don't have to go through years of intensive training. All of those things are right and good in their own place. But friends, God's word has been made so that you can understand it, that I can understand it. And we can not only understand it, but understand it deeply. John Calvin put it this way. He said, Scripture is like a pair of spectacles which dispels the darkness and gives us a clear view of God. That's only possible if you can understand it. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7 says, These words which I'm commanding to you today, God is speaking to the Israelites, shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently. The only way you can teach something is if you understand it. If you don't understand it, you can't teach it. Any teacher will tell you. Psalm 119, verses 130 says, The unfolding of your words give light. It gives understanding to the Jeremiah's of the world, the simple. That's really good news, friends. All of this that we've said about God's word, it's so necessary. It's the revelation of salvation. The, The only way that we can know God is through his word and friends, You can know the word of God because it's understandable. That's significant. By the way, that's um, that's one of the main reasons for the Reformation. Back in the 1500s, Martin Luther nailing on the Wittenberg door the 95 Thesis. One of the main reasons he did that was because the Pope and the Catholics were saying, you can't understand scripture. You need us to tell you what scripture says. And, And Martin Luther said, no, 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 no. Priesthood of the believers means you can understand God's word for yourself. Praise God, you don't need me to help you know scripture. I can help you, but you can know scripture on your own. That's what the Holy Spirit does within us. So let me give a couple of statements here. Again, implications of the perspicuity of scripture. Scripture ought to be approached with right expectations of understanding what is said. You should read your Bible not with an ready-made excuse. Well, I won't even be able to understand half of it. Expect to understand it. Think about that mindset of shifting. I am going to understand what I'm reading. I can understand what God is saying. That is what God's word is meant to be, understood by God's children. Have an expectant attitude and do the hard work to understand it, which is why the second statement is, Christians ought to pursue every available avenue to understand scripture even more. You should, in Christ, be wanting to take part of every resource and everything made available to understand more more clearly what has been made simple through the word of God. That should be a, a high desire of what you are called to do is to know scripture even more. Now there's a potential problem here that I would just want to give reference to. Um, scripture can be hard to understand. 
Okay, and I'm not denying that. The perspicuity of Scripture is not saying that everything in Scripture is really easy. It's not even saying that everything in Scripture you're fully going to understand. How many of us can resonate with Peter? In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, he's talking about Paul's letters here when he says, also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to understand. That's an understatement. How many of us have read Romans chapter 9, for instance? Esau I have loved... Uh, no, wait, Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. Well, wait, how do I understand that? That's a hard thing to understand, right? There are hard doctrines to understand in Scripture. Well, we should be very thankful that Peter had the same problem. Paul is difficult to understand, and then he says, which the untaught, the unstable distort, as they do with the rest of Scripture, to their own destruction. So what do we do with these really difficult texts? Not all texts are easily understood. What do we do with those? Well, first, we look to Scripture. We see what uh, God says in Isaiah 55 when he says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Understand that there are some things in your finiteness that you will never understand until you reach glory, and we need to be okay with that. Because when we get to glory, this is what Paul tells us from 1 Corinthians 13, 12, that for now we see only reflection as in a mirror, but then in his glory, in his presence, we will see face to face. Some things we're never going to fully understand until we get to glory. But when we get to glory, we will understand all of these wonderful, rich truths of God's word and what he has said. So first, understand, there are difficult texts. Understand that you might never be able to understand it fully and completely, and that needs to be okay with you because of the God who is greater than us. Secondly, understand that God has made clear the fundamentals and the things that are more difficult are likely not the essentials to your faith. Does that make sense? The essentials to your faith are clear. I am not saying the non-essentials to your faith should not be studied in great depth. I'm saying don't lose sleep over them. I'm saying don't lose friendships over them. I'm saying don't lose your faith over wrestling with those texts. Okay? Does that make sense? Study them. Work hard to understand them. But understand the essentials of the faith are clear and they are simple. I have one more principle. But here's what I need from you all. Because I'm going over your time. I need you to give me a thumbs up if you're ready for the, la- the seventh and the last principle. And I need a thumbs up from everybody. All right. That's an old teacher trick for all you teachers out there. All right, you've given me permission. So let's do the final final principle. So we've talked about so much of Scripture. The final last one is the sufficiency of Scripture or sola scriptura. Sola scriptura is one of the five main core tenets or confessions of the Reformation And this is where it all begins. Sola Scriptura is Latin for Scripture alone. This is the truth. Let me put this up there. You've got it on your handout. The sufficiency of Scripture means Scripture is all that's needed for life and godliness. I could give and will at some point give sermons on the sufficiency of Scripture. So I'm going to boil it down to, to just very simple You and I, when it boils down to life, it's good for us to learn things about the world. It's good for you to have outside interests of hobbies and skills, and all of those things are great. There's nothing wrong with that. Learn those things. But all of that pales in comparison to knowing God's word because scripture is sufficient for what you need in this life. So you can go the rest of your life without going to another college class. You can go the rest of your life without learning a skill set. You cannot go the rest of your life without being immersed in the Word of God. And in fact, if you fail to be immersed in the Word of God, then you're going to miss a whole lot of truths, perhaps even salvation itself. So this is what Paul would say in Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete, because he is the head over all rule and authority. Friends, 
there are doctrines that are at work right now that are trying to do exactly what Paul warns against in verse 8 that it's trying to say that Scripture is not completely sufficient in and of itself, but you have to add to Scripture. You have to divest of certain things that are naturally within you. And friends, what the sufficiency of Scripture says, all you need is the truth of God's Word. And if you're importing anything else, whether it's political ideology or social proclivities, then you're going to miss the truths of Scripture altogether. Scripture itself is sufficient. I referenced this earlier. We read it earlier. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. I love it. And from childhood, Timothy, you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. It's the scripture that does that. But the scripture doesn't only just give salvation. It's inspired by God. We talked about that. But notice what scripture does. It's profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. You need nothing outside of that. Nothing. Nothing. Teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness, so that you, man of God, will be adequate, equipped for every good work. You will be of no value to the kingdom of God if you are not shaped and formed by the sufficiency of God's word. This is what molds us. I can't say it any better than one more passage here. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything. Everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and excellence. Did you know that verse? That's the sufficiency of scripture. Everything pertaining to life and godliness, that's, that's it. That covers every base. There's nothing more to add to that, which for sake of time, I'm going to bypass these scriptures which say not to add or subtract. That's from Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 12, Revelation 22. It says don't add to the word of God. Don't subtract to the word of God. Here's two confessions of faith. Second, Baptist, uh, Second London Baptist Confession says the Holy Scripture is the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience Although the light of nature and the work of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness, wisdom, power of God as to leave men inexcusable, yet they are not sufficient to give that knowledge of God and his will, which is necessary unto salvation, the essential nature of the word of God and the sufficiency of the word of God rather than general revelation. Once more from the Belgic Confession of 1561. For since it is forbidden to add to the word of God or take anything away from it, it is plainly demonstrated that the teaching is perfect and complete in all respects. Therefore, we must not consider human writings, no matter how holy their authors may have been, equal to the divine writings, nor may we put custom, nor the majority, nor age, nor the passage of times or persons, nor councils, decrees, or official decisions above the truth of God, for truth is above everything else. That's pretty plain language, isn't it? So let me then give, I'm going to close here with four statements of implications of the sufficiency of Scripture and try to keep these pretty simple and quick. First, implication, study God's Word. It's all you need for life. Go to school, do well in school, but not to the neglect of God's Word. Having a good job means nothing if you've lost your soul because God's Word means nothing to you. Study the Word of God. It's all you need for life. You can do any other career, but you only have this one soul. And how you relate to the Lord through his word, that's going to change everything. Excel in knowing scripture. Second statement here. Scripture is God's finished word. Nothing else is needed. Friends, don't try to import what you see on TV and social media into your religious life or anything else in your life. If you want to know everything that you need to be a successful human, to see reality as it really is, and to live a life that is pleasing to your creator and savior, open God's word. Read, invest, memorize, meditate, study. Third implication or, uh, or truth here, don't mix the oil of earthly wisdom with the sufficient living water of God's wisdom through scripture. I unashamedly, wholeheartedly believe 
that what Scripture says is that Scripture is the answer, is the solution to all of life's problems. So that's why I am a biblical counselor. So I, I have certainly understand that there are some biological issues that happen, but if somebody comes to me and they have been labeled as a narcissist, I am going to take them not to the DSM, I'm going to take them to the Word of God because I believe that God has the answers to narcissistic tendencies. If somebody comes and has been bi diagnosed as bipolar, I am going to take them to the Word of God because I think that's where the answers lie, not in a diagnosis. If somebody has been diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder or suicidal ideation or major depressive disorder, I'm going to take them to the word of God because I cannot comprehend, nor do I see within scripture, a God who has made mankind as his crowning achievement and yet doesn't give us the answers to some of the most foundational issues of our lives. What kind of a God would it be? If he says, I love you so much, I'm going to save you, but the greatest issues that are going on in your heart and your mind, I don't know how to talk about that. Does that seem like a sufficient God? Or is the sufficient word of God say, I've got the answers to that. I know how to speak to narcissism and bipolar tendencies and depression and all of these things. Whatever might be ailing you, God's word is the answer. We must be unashamedly about that. We must be wise but we must be unashamedly about that. And we'll talk about more of biblical counseling in, uh, later on this year. It's actually going to be one of our Sunday night theologies, but I uh, want to make sure that we don't ex mix the oil of earthly wisdom with the living water of God's word. Fourth and final, and this is it, this is it. Implication of the sufficiency of Scripture. Scripture alone holds the answers necessary for society's greatest problems. Now, friends, I'm living for a greater life than this one but I am called to live in this life to do as well as I can for my neighbors. And that means in the political realm, that means in the cultural realm, that means in the societal, in my community, all of these things are applicable. And the answers are not what these other people and the world think is going to fix the problem. It's not going to be what Washington, D.C. says, no matter who's sitting in the president's chair. It's not going to be from the governor's office. The answers are going to come from Scripture. And you and I must not get caught up in the games of our culture and the political realm. We have to be caught up in the truth of the sufficiency of Scripture. Because when we be more fo if we're more, more focused on the noise of our culture, then we can't hear clearly the sufficiency of God's Word. So friends, when we talk about Scripture, when we open up God's Word... We are saying that it's necessary. We are saying that it is inspired. We are saying that it is inerrant. We are saying that it is infallible, authoritative, perspicuous, perspicuous and that's the way to say that, and sufficient. Those are the seven principles of God's word, special revelation that leads to salvation. That's the word of God. Now, we could expound upon all of those even more, but that's the essential truths of the word of God, which leads us to salvation in him. Now, friends, you have been incredibly gracious. I told you you're going to be out by seven, and your tummies are telling you it's past seven. Mine too. So let me, uh, that's right. Um, so if you have any questions, thoughts, or anything that you want to know further about from what we've talked about, I'll be standing up here. I'll hang around for a while if you want to talk about anything. Um, man, I'd love to talk about that. These are deep issues. Hopefully, it's been very practical for our lives of how it applies to our lives. Um, I'm happy to talk about any of these things, think through them with you. Next month, uh, when we get back together on Sunday night, it's going to be March 28th, and we're going to talk about the attributes of God, the nature of the divine. So this is the word of God, but we need to understand the God who is working behind his word. So we start out with the word of God and then use his word to understand who he is. We'll do that on the 28th and then we'll go into some other topics throughout the remainder of the year. Thank you so much for being here. Let me uh, close us in prayer and then uh, you'll be dismissed. Let's pray. Oh, Father, how gracious and merciful you are. Thank you that we don't have to guess uh, that what you want us to do. Thank you that we don't have to guess what salvation is all about, but through your word, we have absolute certainty of truth. Father, thank you that your word is without error, that it couldn't even possibly have error. Thank you that it 
is authoritative and thank you that it's sufficient. Might each one of us as we leave this place be convinced of the importance of an objective truth, the objective truth from your word and might that be our guiding light as we go into our jobs, we go into our week, we go to whatever it might be that you've placed before us so that we might faithfully endure by looking to you through your word. So Father, we just pray that you will bless each person here, that you will help us to be people, not only who say that we're of the word, but we truly love your word, we study it, and it is the very air that we breathe, the living water that we drink. It's everything that we need to continue further. So Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your son. And thank you for the fellowship that we have with brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. We pray these things in the resurrected, perfect, holy name and all of God's people said, amen. Thank you so much for being here.